Book One, Chapter Two of British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends, and Traditions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. British Goblins, Welsh Folklore, Fairy Mythology, Legends, and Traditions by Vert Sykes. Book One. Chapter Two, Part One, Fairies being creatures of the imagination, it is not possible to classify them by fixed and immutable rules. In the exact sciences, there are laws which never vary, or if they vary, their very eccentricity is governed by precise rules. Even in the largest sense, comparative mythology must demean itself modestly in order to be tolerated in the severe company of the sciences. In presenting his subjects, therefore, the writer in this field can only govern himself by the purpose of orderly arrangement. To secure the maximum of system for the sake of the student who employs the work for reference and comparison, with the minimum of dullness, for the sake of the general reader, is perhaps the limit of a reasonable ambition. Kitely divides into four classes the Scandinavian elements of popular belief as to fairies. 1. The elves. 2. The dwarves, or trolls. 3. The Nisses, and 4. The next Mermen and Mermaids. How entirely arbitrary this division is, the student of Scandinavian folklore at once perceives, yet it is perhaps as satisfactory as another. The fairies of Wales may be divided into five classes, if analogy be not too sharply insisted on. Thus we have 1. The Ethelon, or Elves, 2. The Koblinau, or Mine Fairies, 3. The Bugachod, or Household Fairies, four, the Guraged Anun, or fairies of the lakes and streams, and five, the Guishon, or mountain fairies. The modern Welsh name for fairies is Itelwithteg, the fair folk, or family. This is sometimes lengthened into Itelwithteg un Ikod, the fair family in the wood, or Telwithteg Moon, the fair folk of the mine. They are seen dancing in moonlight nights on the velvety grass, clad in airy and flowing robes of blue, green, white, or scarlet. Details as to color not usually met, I think, in accounts of fairies. They are spoken of as bestowing blessings on those mortals whom they select to be thus favored, and again are called bendithi mamau, or their mother's blessing, that is to say, good little children whom it is a pleasure to know. To name the fairies by a harsh epithet is to invoke their anger, to speak of them in flattering phrases to propitiate their good offices. The student of fairy mythology perceives in this propitiatory mode of speech a fact of wide significance. It can be traced in numberless lands and back to the beginning of human history among the cloud-hung peaks of Central Asia. The Greeks spoke of the Furies as the Eumenides, or Gracious Ones. Highlanders mentioned by Sir Walter Scott uncover to the gibbet and call it the Kind Gallows, the Dyak will not name the smallpox, but calls it the chief. The Laplander calls the bear the old man, with the fur coat. In Amam the tiger is called grandfather, and it is thought that the maxim speak only good of the dead came originally from the notion of propitiating the ghost of the departed, who in laying off this mortal garb had become endowed with new powers of harming his late acquaintance. Part 2 the echelon are the pygmy elves who haunt the groves and valleys and correspond pretty closely with the english elves the english name was probably derived from the welsh el a spirit elf an element there is a whole brood of words in this class in the welsh language expressing every variety of flowing gliding spirituality devilry angelhood and goblinism echelon the plural of echel is also doubtless allied with the hebrew elilim having with it an identity both of origin and meaning. The poet Daphid ab Gwilym, in a humorous account of his troubles in a mist in the year 1340, says, There was in every hollow a hundred wry-mouthed elves. The hollows, or little dingles, are still the places where the peasant, belated on his homeward way from fair or market, looks for the echelon, but fails to find them. Their food is specified in Welsh folklore as fairy butter and fairy victuals, imeninen telwiteg and buid echelon, the latter the toadstool or poisonous mushroom, and the former a butter resembling substance found at great depths in the crevices of limestone rocks in sinking for lead ore. 
Their gloves, menig echelon, are the bells of the digitalis, or foxglove, the leaves of which are well known to be strong sedative. Their queen, for though there is no fairy queen in the large sense that Guinap Nud is the fairy king, there is a queen of the elves, is none other than the Shakespearean fairy spoken of by Mercutio, who comes in a shape no bigger than the agate stone, on the forefinger of an alderman. Shakespeare's use of Welsh folklore, it should be noted, was extensive and peculiarly faithful. Kitely, in his fairy mythology, rates the bard soundly for his inaccurate use of English fairy superstitions, but the reproach will not apply as regards Wales. From his Welsh informant Shakespeare got Mab, which is simply the cumric for a little child and the root of numberless words signifying babyish, childish, love for children, Mabgar, kitten, Mabgath, prattling, Mabeth, and the like, most notable of all which is this connection to Mabinogi, the singular of Maminojon, the romantic tales of enchantment told to the young in bygone ages. Part 3. In the Huntsman's Rest Inn at Peterstone Superelli, near Cardiff, sat a group of humble folk one afternoon when I chanced to stop there to rest myself by the chimney-side, after a long walk through green lanes. The men were drinking their tankards of ale and smoking their long clay pipes, and they were talking about their dogs and horses, the crops, the hard times, and the prospect of bettering themselves by emigration to America. On this latter theme I was able to make myself interesting, and acquaintance was thereupon easily established on a friendly footing. I led the conversation into the domain of folklore, and this book is richer in illustration on many a page in consequence. Among others, this tale was told. On a certain farm in Glamorganshire lived Rowley Pooh, who was known far and wide for his evil luck. Nothing prospered that he turned his hand to. His crops proved poor, though his neighbors might be good. His roof leaked in spite of all his mending. His walls remained damp when everyone else's walls were dry. And above all, his wife was so feeble she could do no work. His fortunes at last seemed so hard that he resolved to sell out and clear out, no matter at what loss, and try to better himself in another country. Not by going to America, for there was no America in those days. Well, and if there was, the poor Welshman didn't know it. So as Rowley was sitting on his wall one day, hard by his cottage, musing over his sad lot, he was accosted by a little man who asked him what was the matter. Rowley looked around in surprise, but before he could answer, the Eshel said to him with a grin, "'There, there, hold your tongue. I know more about you than you ever dreamed of knowing. You're in trouble, and you're going away. But you may stay now I've spoken to you. Only bid your good wife leave the candle burning when she goes to bed, and say no more about it.' With this the Eshel kicked up his heels and disappeared. Of course the farmer did as he was bid, and from that day he prospered. Every night Catty Jones, his wife, set the candle out, swept the hearth, and went to bed, and every night the fairies would come and do her baking and brewing, her washing and mending, sometimes even furnishing their own tools and materials. The farmer was now always clean of linen and whole of garb. He had good bread and good beer. He felt like a new man and worked like one. Everything prospered with him now as nothing had before. His crops were good, his barns were tidy, his cattle were sleek, his pigs the fattest in the parish. So things went on for three years. One night, Caddy Jones took it into her head that she must have a peep at the fair family who did her work for her, and curiosity conquering prudence, she arose while Rowley Pug lay snoring, and peeped through a crack in the door. There they were, a jolly company of echelon, working away like mad, and laughing and dancing as madly as they worked. Catty was so amused that in spite of herself she fell to laughing too, and at the sound of her voice the echelon scattered like mist before the wind, leaving the room empty. They never came back any more, but the farmer was now prosperous, and his bad luck never returned to plague him. The resemblance of this tale to many he has encountered will at once be noted by the student of comparative folklore. He will also observe that it trenches on the domain of another class in my own enumeration, vis-à-vis -vis that of the bubach, or household fairy. This is the stone over which one is constantly stumbling in this field of scientific research. Mr. Berengold's idea that all household tales are reducible to a primeval root, in the same or a similar manner that we trace words to their roots, though most ingeniously illustrated by him, is constantly involved in trouble of the sort mentioned. 
he encounters the obstacle which lies in the path of all who walk this way his roots sometimes get inextricably gnarled and intertwisted with each other but some effort of this sort is imperative and we must do the best we can with our materials stories of the class of grimm's witchelmänner kinder und hausmarchen will be recalled by the legend of raleigh pug as here told the german housemänner are elves of a domestic turn sometimes mischievous and sometimes useful but usually looking for some material reward for their labours so with the english goblin named by milton in laigro which drudges to earn his cream bowl duly set part four the echeladon is a species of elf exactly corresponding to the english will-o'-wisp the scandinavian lictugib and the breton sand yanitad the welsh word don means fire don also means allure the compound word suggests alluring elf fire the breton sand yanitad st john and father is a double ignis fatus fairy carrying at its finger ends five lights which spin round like a wheel the negroes of the southern seabird states of america invest this goblin with an exaggeration of the horrible peculiarly their own they call it jack my lantern and describe it as a hideous creature five feet in height with goggle eyes and a huge mouth its body covered with long hair and which goes leaping and bounding through the air like a gigantic grasshopper this frightful apparition is stronger than any man and swifter than any horse and compels its victims to follow it into the swamp where it leaves them to die like all goblins of this class the echelon was of course seen dancing about in marshy grounds into which it led the belated wanderer but as a distinguished resident in wales has wittily said the poor elf is now starved to death and his breath is taken from him his light is quenched for ever by the improving farmer who has drained the bog and instead of the rank decaying vegetation of the autumn where bitterns and snipes delighted to secrete themselves crops of corn and potatoes are grown a poetic account by a modern character called iolo the bard is thus condensed one night when the moon had gone down as i was sitting on a hilltop the echeladon passed by i followed it into the valley we crossed plashes of water where the tops of bulrushes peeped above and where the lizards lay silently on the surface looking at us with an unmoved stare the frogs sat croaking and swelling their sides but ceased as they raised a melancholy eye at the echelon the wild fowl sleeping with their heads under their wings made a low cackle as we went by a bittern awoke and rose with a scream into the air i felt the trail of the eels and leeches peering about as i waded through the pools on a slimy stone a toad sat sucking poison from the night air the echeladon glowed bravely in the slumbering vapours it rose airily over the bushes that drooped in the ooze when i lingered or stopped it waited for me but dwindled gradually away to a speck barely perceptible but as soon as i moved on again it would shoot up suddenly and glide before a bat came flying round and round us flapping its wings heavily screech owls stared silently at us with their broad eyes snails and worms crawled about the fine threads of a spider's web gleamed in the light of the echeladon suddenly it shot away from me and in the distance joined a ring of its fellows who went dancing slowly round and round in a goblin dance which sent me off to sleep part five puka or puka is but another name for the echeladon as our puck is another name for the will-o'-wisp but in both cases the shorter term has a more poetic flavour and a wider latitude the name puck was originally applied to the whole race of english fairies and there still be few of the realm who enjoy a wider popularity than puck in spite of his mischievous attributes part of this popularity is due to the poets especially to shakespeare i have alluded to the bard's accurate knowledge of welsh folklore the subject is really one of unique interest in view of the inaccuracy charged upon him as to the english fairyland there is a welsh tradition to the effect that shakespeare received his knowledge of the cambrian fairies from his friend richard price son of sir john price of the priory of brecon it is even claimed that cum puca or puck valley a part of the romantic glen of the clydeck in breconshire is the original scene of the midsummer night's dream a fancy as light and airy as puck himself anyhow there cum puca is and in the sylvan days before frere and powell's ironworks were set up there it is said to have been as full of goblins as a methodist's head is of piety 
and there are in Wales other places bearing like names where Puka's pranks are well remembered by old inhabitants. The range given to the popular fancy in Wales is expressed with fidelity by Shakespeare's words in the mouth of Puck. I'll follow you, I'll lead you about around, through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometime a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire, and neigh and bark and grunt and roar and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. The various stories I have encountered bear out these details almost without an omission. In his own proper character, however, Puka has a sufficiently grotesque elfish aspect. It is stated that a Welsh peasant, who was asked to give an idea of the appearance of Puka, drew the above figure with a bit of coal. A servant girl who tended to the cattle on the Truin farm near Abiguidon used to take food to Master Puka, as she called the elf. A bowl of fresh milk and a slice of white bread were the component parts of the goblin's repast, and were placed on a certain spot where he got them. One night the girl, moved by the spirit of mischief, drank the milk and ate most of the bread, leaving for Master Puka only water and crusts. Next morning she found that the fastidious fairy had left the food untouched. Not long after, as the girl was passing the lonely spot where she had hitherto left Puka his food, she was seized under the armpits by fleshly hands, which, however, she could not see, and subjected to a castigation of a most mortifying character. Simultaneously there fell upon her ear in good set Welsh a warning not to repeat her offence on peril of still worse treatment. The story is thoroughly believed in there to this day. I visited the scene of the story, a farm near Abergudon, now called Abercarne, and heard a great deal more of the exploits of that particular puka, to which I will refer again. The most singular fact of the matter is that although at least a century has elapsed, and some say several centuries since the exploits in question, you cannot find a Welsh peasant in the parish but knows all about puka truin. Part 6 the most familiar form of the puka story is one which I have encountered in several localities, varying so little in its details that each account would be interchangeable with another by alternation of local names. This form presents a peasant who is returning home from his work, or from a fair, when he sees a light travelling before him. Looking closer, he perceives that it is carried by a dusky little figure holding a lantern or candle at arm's length over its head. He follows it for several miles and suddenly finds himself on the brink of a frightful precipice. From far down below there rises to his ears the sound of a foaming torrent. At the same moment the little goblin with the lantern springs across the chasm, alighting on the opposite side, raises the light again high over its head, utters a loud and malicious laugh, blows out its candle, and disappears up the opposite hill, leaving the awestruck peasant to get home as best he can. Part 7 under the general title of Coblinau, I class the fairies which haunt the mines, quarries, and underground regions of Wales, corresponding to the Kabbalistic gnomes. The word coblin has the double meaning of knocker or thumper and sprite or fiend, and may it not be the original of goblin? It is applied by Welsh miners to pygmy fairies which dwell in the mines, and point out by a peculiar knocking or rapping rich veins of ore. The faith is extended in some parts so as to cover the indication of subterranean treasures generally, in caves and secret places of the mountains. The now are described as being about a half a yard in height, and very ugly to look upon, but extremely good-natured and warm friends of the miner. Their dress is a grotesque imitation of the miner's garb, and they carry tiny hammers, picks, and lamps. They work busily, loading ore in buckets, flitting about the shafts, turning tiny windlasses, and pounding away like madmen, but really accomplishing nothing whatever. They have been known to throw stones at the miners when enraged at being lightly spoken of, but the stones are harmless. Nevertheless, all miners of a proper spirit refrain from provoking them, because their presence brings good luck. Part 8 Miners are possibly no more superstitious than other men of equal intelligence, I have heard some of their number repel indignantly the idea that they are superstitious at all, but this would simply be to raise them above the level of our common humanity. There is testimony enough besides to support my own conclusions, which accredit a liberal share of credulity to the mining class. The Awastry Advertiser, 
a short time ago, recorded the fact that at Keffin, a woman is employed as messenger at one of the collieries, and as she commences her duty early each morning, she meets great numbers of colliers going to their work. Some of them, we are gravely assured, consider it a bad omen to meet a woman first thing in the morning, and not having succeeded in deterring her from her work by other means, they waited upon the manager and declared that they should remain at home unless the woman was dismissed. This was in 1874. In June 1878, the South Wales Daily News recorded a superstition of the quarrymen at Penhurn, where some thousands of men refused to work on Ascension Day. This refusal did not arise out of any reverential feeling, but from an old and widespread superstition which has lingered in that district for years, that if work is continued on Ascension Day, an accident will certainly follow. A few years ago, the agents persuaded the men to break through the superstition, and there were accidents each year, a not unlikely occurrence, seeing the extent of works carried on, and the dangerous nature of the occupation of the men. This year, however, the men, one and all, refused to work. These are examples dealing with considerable numbers of the mining class, and are quoted in this instance as being more significant than individual cases would be. Of these last, I have encountered many, Yet I should be sorry if any reader were to conclude from all this that Welsh miners are not in the main intelligent, church-going, newspaper-reading men. They are so, I think, even beyond the common. Their superstitions, therefore, like those of the rest of us, must be judged as a thing apart, not to be reconciled with intelligence and education, but coexisting with them. Absolute freedom from superstition can come only with a degree of scientific culture not yet reached by mortal man." It can hardly be cause for wonder that the miner should be superstitious. His life is passed in a dark and gloomy region, fathoms below the earth's green surface, surrounded by walls on which dim lamps shed a fitful light. It is not surprising that imagination, and the Welsh imagination is peculiarly vivid, should conjure up the faces and forms of gnomes and goblinau, of phantoms and fairy men. When they hear the mysterious thumping which they know is not produced by any human being, and when, in examining the place where the noise was heard, they find there are really valuable indications of ore, the sturdiest incredulity must sometimes be shaken. Science points out that the noise may be produced by the action of water upon the loose stones in fissures and potholes of the mountain limestone, and does actually suggest the presence of metals. In the days before a priestly had caught and bottled that demon, which exists in the shape of carbonic acid gas, when the miner was smitten dead by an invisible foe in the deep bowels of the earth, it was natural his awestruck companions should ascribe the mysterious blow to a supernatural enemy. When the workman was assailed suddenly by what we now call fire damp, which hurled him and his companions right and left upon the dark rocks, scorching, burning, and killing, those who survived were not likely to question the existence of the mine fiend. Hence arose the superstition, now probably quite extinct, of basilisks in the mines, which destroyed with their terrible gaze. When the explanation came that the thing which killed the miner was what he breathed, not what he saw, and when chemistry took the fire damp from the domain of fairy, the basilisk and the fire fiend had not a leg to stand on. The explanation of the knockers is more recent and less palpable and convincing. Part 9. The Koblinau are always given the form of dwarves in the popular fancy, Wherever seen or heard, they are believed to have escaped from the mines or the secret regions of the mountains. Their homes are hidden from mortal vision. When encountered, either in the mines or on the mountains, they have strayed from their special abodes, which are as spectral as themselves. There is at least one account, extant, of their secret territory having been revealed to mortal eyes. I find it in a quaint volume, of which I shall have more to say, printed at Newport, Monmouthshire, in 1813. It relates that one William Evans of Haffadaffel, while crossing the Beacon Mountain very early in the morning, passed a fairy coal mine where fairies were busily at work. Some were cutting the coal, some carrying it to fill the sacks, some raising the loads upon the horses' backs, and so on, but all in the completest silence. He thought this a wonderful extra-natural thing, and was considerably impressed by it, for well he knew that there really was no coal mine at that place. He was a person of undoubted veracity, and what is more, a great man in the world, above telling an untruth. That the cobbler now sometimes wandered far from home, the same chronicler testifies, but on these occasions they were taking a holiday. 
Egbert Williams, a pious young gentleman of Denbighshire, then at school, was one day playing in a field called K. Khaled, in the parish of Bodfery, with three girls, one of whom was his sister. Near the stile beyond Lanaluid House, they saw a company of fifteen or sixteen Koblinau engaged in dancing madly. They were in the middle of the field, about seventy yards from the spectators, and they danced something after the manner of Morris dancers, but with a wildness and swiftness in their motions. They were clothed in red like British soldiers, and wore red handkerchiefs spotted with yellow wound around their heads. And a strange circumstance about them was that although they were almost as big as ordinary men, yet they had unmistakably the appearance of dwarfs, and one could call them nothing but dwarfs. Presently one of them left the company and ran towards the group near the stile, who were direfully scared thereby, and scrambled in great fright to go over the stile. Barbara Jones got over first, then her sister, and as Egbert Williams was helping his sister over, they saw the coblin close upon them, and barely got over when his hairy hand was laid on the stile. He stood leaning on it, gazing after them as they ran, with a grim copper-coloured countenance and a fierce look. The young people ran to Lanaluid House and called the elders out, but though they hurried quickly to the field, the dwarfs had already disappeared. Part 10. The counterparts of the Koblenau are found in most mining countries. In Germany, the Wichtlein, the Little Whites, are little old long-bearded men about three-quarters of an L high, which haunt the mines of the southern land. The Bohemians call the Wichtlein by the name of Hausschmiedlein, little house smiths, from their sometimes making a noise as if laboring hard at the anvil. They are not so popular as in Wales, however, as they predict misfortune or death. They announce the doom of a miner by knocking three times distinctly, and when any lesser evil is about to befall him, they are heard digging, pounding, and imitating other kinds of work. In Germany, also, the kobolds are rather troublesome than otherwise, to the miners, taking pleasure in frustrating their objects and rendering their toil unfruitful. Sometimes they are downright malignant, especially if neglected or insulted, but sometimes also they are indulgent to individuals whom they take under their protection. When a miner therefore hit upon a rich vein of ore, the inference commonly was not that he possessed more skill, industry, or even luck than his fellow workmen, but that the spirits of the mine had directed him to the treasure. The intimate connection between mine fairies and the whole race of dwarfs is constantly met throughout the fairy mythology, and the connection of the dwarfs with the mountains is equally universal. God, says the preface to the Helden book, gave the dwarfs being because the land and the mountains were altogether waste and uncultivated, and there was much store of silver and gold and precious stones and pearls still in the mountains. From the most ancient times, and in the oldest countries, down to our own time and the new world of America, the traditions are the same. The old Norse belief which made the dwarfs the current machinery of the northern sagas is echoed in the Catskill Mountains with the rolling of the thunder among the crags where Hendrik Hudson's dwarfs are playing ninepins. Part 11 the Bubak, or Bubak, is the good-natured goblin which does good turns for the tidy Welsh maid who wins its favour by a certain course of behaviour recommended by long tradition. The maid, having swept the kitchen, makes a good fire the last thing at night, and having put the churn filled with cream on the whitened hearth with a basin of fresh cream for the Bubak on the hob, goes to bed to await the event. In the morning she finds, if she is in luck, that the bubak has emptied the basin of cream and plied the churn dasher so well that the maid has but to give a thump or two to bring the butter in a great lump. Like the eschel, which it so much resembles, the bubak does not approve of dissenters and their ways, and especially strong is its aversion to total abstainers. There was a bubak belonging to a certain estate in Cardiganshire, which took great umbrage at a Baptist preacher who was a guest in the house and who was much fonder of prayers than of good ale. Now the Bubak had a weakness in favour of people who sat around the hearth with their mugs of kuruda and their pipes, and it took to pestering the preacher. One night it jerked the stool from under the good man's elbows as he knelt pouring forth prayer, so that he fell down flat on his face. Another time it interrupted the devotions by jangling the fire irons on the hearth, and it was continually making the dogs fall howling during prayers, or frightening the farm-boy by grinning at him through the window, or throwing the maid into fits. 
At last it had the audacity to attack the preacher as he was crossing a field. The minister told the story in this wise. I was reading busily in my hymn-book as I walked on, when a sudden fear came over me and my legs began to tremble. A shadow crept upon me from behind, and when I turned round, it was myself, my person, my dress, and even my hymn-book. I looked on its face a moment, and then fell insensible to the ground. And there, insensible still, they found him. This encounter proved too much for the good man, who considered it a warning to him to leave those parts. He accordingly mounted his horse next day and rode away. A boy of the neighborhood, whose veracity was, like that of all boys, unimpeachable, afterwards said that he saw the buvac jump up behind the preacher on the horse's back and the horse went like lightning, with eyes like balls of fire, and the preacher looking back over his shoulder at the buback that grinned from ear to ear. Part 12. The same confusion in outlines which exists regarding our own bogey and hobgoblin gives the buback a double character, as a household fairy and as a terrifying phantom. In both aspects it is ludicrous, but in the latter it has dangerous practices. To get into its clutches under certain circumstances is no trifling matter, for it has the power of whisking people off through the air. Its services are brought into requisition for this purpose by troubled ghosts who cannot sleep on account of hidden treasure they want removed, and if they can succeed in getting a mortal to help them in removing the treasure, they employ the buback to transport the mortal through the air. This ludicrous fairy is in France represented by the gobelin. Mothers threaten children with him, Le gobelin vous mangera, le gobelin vous emportera. In the English hobgoblin we have a word apparently derived from the Welsh hob, to hop, and coblin, a goblin, which presents a hopping goblin to the mind, and suggests the puka, with which the bubak is also confused in the popular fancy at times, but should mean in English simply the goblin of the hob, or household fairy. In its bugbear aspect, the bubak, like the English bogey, is believed to be identical with the Slavonic bog and the baga of the cuneiform inscriptions, both of which are names for the supreme being, according to Professor Fisk. The ancestral form of these epithets is found in the old Aryan bahaga, which reappears unchanged in the Sanskrit of the Vedas, and has left a memento of itself in the surname of the Phrygian Zeus Bagaios. It seems originally to have denoted either the unclouded sun or the sky of noonday illuminated by the solar rays. Thus the same name which to the Vedic poet, to the Persian of the time of Xerxes, and to the modern Russian suggests the supreme majesty of deity is in English associated with an ugly and ludicrous fiend closely akin to that grotesque northern devil of whom Southey was unable to think without laughing. End of Book One Chapter 2